N.D. Wilson is a best-selling author and fellow of literature at New St. Andrews College. His book, Death by Living, won top honors in Christianity Today's 2014 Book Awards in the Spirituality category. Uh, he received his B.A. from New St. Andrews College in 1999 and an M.A. from St. John's in Annapolis, Maryland in 2001. Uh, Nate is the author of several titles, including, including notes from the tilt a -Whirl, the Ashtown Burial Series, the 100 Cup Cupboards Trilogy, and Lee Pike Ridge. He's also a film producer and screenwriter, and he got in on a plane last night at 3 in the morning. Uh, so this is going to be fun. <laughs> so give a warm welcome to Nate Wilson. I always appreciate it when excuses are given in advance. <laughs> it's very helpful. Uh, let's pray. Father, thank you for this day, for this season, for our ability to gather, to remember those who've gone before us. I pray that you'd bless us, bless our time together, and make us as faithful as our forefathers. In your son's name, amen. Okay, so... It's going to be a little bit of story time, some of it. When I was, I don't even know how old, 12, 13, 14, somewhere in there, I got kind of on a kick about my Scottish ancestry. Because, you know, who doesn't want to get on a kick about their Scottish ancestry at some point? If you're Scottish, you've got you to gotta enjoy it. Now, it, doesn't, it didn't really affect me that I was Jewish enough to make Aliyah in Israel. I wasn't really identifying that direction. I was identifying, as we know, as very important as a Scot. <laughs> so I started researching, to the best of my ability, the Gun Clan, Clan Gun, where the Wilsons came from. And I encountered what is a very famous story among the Gun Clan, which is the story of Helen Gunn, a woman who, the night before her wedding, was abducted by the chieftain of the Keiths, the villainous Keiths. Those Keiths, you know, like various Scottish curses be upon them. Um, <laughs> there's things associated with haggis, you know, there's things that we could just, we could lay out on the Keiths. So Helen Gunn, daughter of the chieftain, was abducted, kidnapped by the chieftain of the Keiths. She was taken off to the castle of the Keiths, this 15th century castle. This is how I'm tying this in. It was the 15th century. <laughs> Where she had, uh, well, misdeeds were attempted upon her. And rather than have them be attempted, she threw herself from the tower, killing herself, uh, and thereby creating a very, very long-standing feud between the guns and the Keiths. Now, in my teenage psyche, I thought, how dare they? Immediately, all the, all the boiling feud blood was, was up. And I thought, I don't think I could ever like a Keith ever. <laughs> if I meet someone last named Keith, do we have anybody in the room? I feel like I would just, you know, want to fight instantly. And I really felt that way, and I was amused by it. It wasn't serious, but at the same time, I was like, oh, this is how that Hatfield-McCoy thing works. This is, this is my Scottish ancestry, to be mad at someone else, totally divided by centuries from something else that happened. Uh, but, you know, they're descended by blood from the original culprits. So I resolved in my head, I thought, I'm pretty sure I could never like a Keith. And then at some point it dawned on me that one of my favorite authors had a middle name, Gilbert Keith Chesterton. And that was his mother's maiden name. <laughs> and I thought, hmm. <laughs> this is how feuds are healed. So this is, <laughs> there is a balm in Gilead that can heal all wounds. I'm still mad about Helen Gunn, though. But still, especially because as a result of the, the just to justify myself, the, uh, the feud that followed, the Keiths were just double-crossing scoundrels and uh, successfully put the guns into a centuries of uh, chieftainlessness, if that's a word, uh, through a betrayal, through a cheat, 
They managed to kill off the chieftain line pretty thoroughly, and it's only recently that the guns have regained a chieftain since that time. Like, there was a long, like, various people have fought for it, but it's been centuries where the gun clan was scattered, all because of that. And still, here's Gilbert Keith Chesterton. And it doesn't just stop there. So not only did his ancestors murder the daughter of my chieftain, he also really, really hates Calvinists. I mean, really, really does not like Calvinists or Calvinism. If, if G.K. Chesterton had a least favorite theology or a least favorite theologian, it would be Calvinism and Calvin. And it shows up over and over and over again. Even as a kid, Reformed theology brought the entire cathedral of creation into focus for me. So I was raised, initially we were a very Baptistic uh, household, thanks dad. And uh, <laughs> I mean the free will Baptist kind. And then uh, things began to change. And as things began to change, and as the teaching around the dinner table began to change, and it changed before the teaching out of the pulpit changed, although it was pretty close, because you know my father tells the story of beginning preaching through Romans and not knowing what he was going to say when he got to you know those bits. So the, the dining room table wasn't too far ahead of the pulpit. But when that teaching began to permeate the home, things began to make sense. Everything began to make sense. How can you pray without ceasing? How can you rejoice in the Lord always? All, the, all these things that are apparently not associated with theology, rejoice in the Lord always, how can you do that? If, how, how can you be grateful tr for trials, for darkness, if it didn't come from God? Like, how can you thank him for that? How can you really weather that? How can Job say, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, when it was the devil? It's like, how can he say that and it's not a lie? Things began to make sense. In fact, I think I was probably not a similar age from when I was first coming into my feud with the Keiths, that I was uh, sitting on a log at a men's retreat in the cold. I've written about this in tilt world but it remains a very, very vivid moment for me where I was sitting there on a log processing God's sovereignty, just trying to get my head around it, which incidentally is impossible, but trying to get my head around it, watching this ice-cold snow melt race underneath the log that was over a creek between these mountains in the trees, and really kind of realizing that, wait a second, all of this is on purpose. Like, all of it. I can say that in a classroom, but getting to a place where it really you, you feel that, where you feel the intentionality of everything around you, you feel the intentionality of the art, of the racing water, of the trees, of the log, of the texture of the wood, and the clouds racing above you, as soon as you realize, wait a second, my father is doing all of this right now. He's busily doing all of these things right now. There is an immediacy to the presence of your father and to your relationship with him. So I was about 13, I think, ish, contemplating this doctrine when it was really starting to sink in. And it sank in past my intellect, where it already had been discussed, and into my bones. And as it did, everything inside that cathedral of creation in which we all exist, from the dust mites to World War I, from singing of creation to the groaning of creation, sunshine and evil, it all began to come into focus as well. Everything here. The teaching of Calvin makes sense of so many things. And of course, it's not the teaching of Calvin. It goes back. It goes back a ways. You see some of it in Augustine, not Augustine, Augustine. Augustine as well. You see it, but you, you see it everywhere. And of course, you see it, you know, really, really delineated and anathematized in various Catholic councils. But they understood it. And you, of course, go back to Paul. And you go back to Isaiah and Moses and go back to Solomon. It's everywhere. It's like, it's not Calvin's. This isn't, this isn't Calvin's doctrine. Calvin is sort of like the guy who broke it out of jail. And we named it after him. But it was there, and it has been there. He gave it to me. I was 21. 
First year of graduate school, this is another story that I have told, and it remains important in my life, so I'll tell it again. I was in Virginia Beach on a perfect day. Blue skies, gorgeous clouds, green grass under a tree with the sunlight just so, reading orthodoxy for my first time. And to be sitting there in Elfland, reading orthodoxy for the first time, was a powerful, powerful thing. And it's the only book still that I have ever finished on that first read, read the last page, and just flipped back to the first page and started again. But I was sitting there feeling extra spiritual, sort of like I was existing inside an inspirational poster. <laughs> if only there had been Instagram, I could have <laughs> gone for it. And it's digital, so you can take as many reps as you need to, just rapid fire. Mm -hmm. Hashtag blessed. <laughs> so I was reading Orthodoxy, and I was feeling like the kind of person who would Instagram about it, even though that didn't exist, when along came a squirrel. And I'm still in the Christian inspirational poster. Right up until the moment the squirrel copped a squat on the branch above me and pooped in the book. <laughs> And I was, sitting, I was sitting there. It's possible that I have had no more Chestertonian and Calvinistic moment at the same time than that. So a tree rodent with a puffy tail before the foundation of the world was ordained for that particular inspirational Christian poster moment. I still have the book somewhere, and I still have the stain <laughs> in the pages. But orthodoxy really came along after all the Reformed theology had really seeped in, after I, was, I really comprehended, understood, loved, and was grateful for the clarity which Reformed theology brought, and for those Reformers who brought it. So I'd gone through NSA as an undergraduate. We'd had the history classes. We had discussed all these things, even high school level classes. I'm no reformed scholar. I'm not even close. But we read about those things. We studied those fellas. We knew what they went through to give us what we have today. So I was built there. That was my architecture. And then I had Chesterton. And when Chesterton arrived, it was like flipping a final breaker that just turned on the party lights brought out the dancers, cueing the music and the squirrels. It was, like, it, was, it was just a, it was next level, it was frosting. But it was really fundamental and essential. Chesterton brought joy. And he brought real joy. It's not that Calvin didn't. It's that Chesterton really, that is his greatest gift. Orthodoxy is his greatest book. And the greatest gift in his greatest book is the gift of joy, deep joy, not trivial, superficial joy, but a profound joy in the narrative and the world in which we're given, which is really, really funny because that joy is powered by gratitude. He's extremely grateful, and gratitude only makes sense if you're a Calvinist, especially when you're grateful like he was for dragons, for enemies. Like how can you be grateful for enemies? Are you grateful to Satan? Or are you grateful to God for the serpent that needs his head crushed? Where do you place that gratitude? Thankfully, human beings are not consistent. I don't know if you've noticed that before. But Chesterton is a, just a prophet of joy. A grateful, grateful man. He was a living celebration. His book, Man Alive, also affected me a great deal. It's a slight fictionalized version of orthodoxy. And he talks about this great miracle of a fat man chasing his hat, a man named Innocent Smith with a tiny head on a huge fat body, chasing his hat in the wind. And when asked how he does it, this miracle of chasing his hat, the answer is, I do it by having two legs. He loved the reality that God gave us. However, from my dear friend, the Keith Gilbert Chesterton, 
The Calvinists took the Catholic idea of the absolute knowledge and power of God and treated it as a rocky, irreducible truism so solid that anything could be built on it, however crushing or cruel. They were so confident in their logic and its one first principle of predestination that they tortured the intellect and imagination with dreadful deductions about God that seemed to turn him into a demon. All right, so those are some strong words. The God of Calvin is a demon. The God I worship is a demon. Incidentally, the God Chesterton worshiped as well. So it's, it's a dangerous thing when you start saying things like, I could never worship a God like that, or that's a demonic God. You've got to really, really know where you're, you're walking. You have to be confident when you say those things. And he walks right into some blasphemous territory. He says in Orthodoxy, famously, and it's also surrounded by some amazing, amazing things, He's talking about poetry versus, you know, the analytical mind. And there's some glorious quotes around it. And he says, among all the rest, that only one great English poet went mad, Cooper. And he was definitely driven mad by logic, by the ugly and alien logic of predestination. Hmm. That's what made him mad? Poetry was not the disease, but the medicine. Poetry partly kept him in health. He could sometimes forget the red and thirsty hell to which his hideous necessitarianism dragged him among the wide waters and the white flat lilies of the house. He was damned by John Calvin. Uh Uh-oh. He was almost saved by John Gilpin. I've never read Gilpin, but I didn't feel like reading it after that sentence. (laughs) So he was damned by John Calvin. What is, we're back to the feud again. We're back to the feud. How can we marry, how can we embrace and marry Chesterton, the glories of Chesterton, that celebration, that artistic romp, that glory that he brings to the table, and also Calvinism, that sturdy hardwood of the Reformed faith. How can we bring these two things together? Even better, Chesterton starts to run into things that he likes in people who happen to be Calvinists, and then he has to really try to find a way to divorce the two things. So think about the calisthenics you've seen a Protestant go through trying to separate a good story from a Catholic writer. It's like, well, his Catholicism doesn't, this is, this is not from his Catholicism. This part of Middle Earth has nothing to do with Tolkien's Catholicism. It just has to do with hobbits, that's all. And beer and smoking pipes, that's all. And there's, there's some truth to that, obviously. But Chesterton does the same thing. He talks about Robert Louis Stevenson. Chesterton loves adventures. He loves romances. The author of Treasure Island, Chesterton is rankled by. He's bothered by him. And he says one of those things that reveals that he also is bothered by, well, Scottish people. (laughs) Which makes me happy. So he, he comments on the sort of the dark, sneaky unhealthiness in Stevenson's mind. It was the shadow of that ancient heathen fatalism which in the 17th century had taken the hardly less heathen form of Calvinism (laughs) and which had sounded so many Scottish tragedies with that note of doom. (laughs) And I think, oh yeah, the bagpipes on the moor. Yeah, I know the note of doom all right. He's, he's attributing that to Calvinism? As a side note, just as a sidebar, just f- some familial pride here, uh, the most doomed Scottish enterprise was the Jacobite Rebellion, which was all papists. Thank you, Gilbert. Papists. It was a Catholic rebellion, and it was the doomed rebellion, the thing that really, you know, the English, pardon, the English really mistreated those poor Scots. But the most doomed thing they ever endeavored was their papist rebellion. And there's even a great song which my people were singing because they refused to participate with papists. You Jacobites by name, now give ear, now give ear. You Jacobites by name, now give ear. Skipping, skipping, skipping. He goes on, this this lovely little folk song. With the Pope you covenant, as they say, as they say. With the Pope you covenant, as they say. And then he goes on and calls the Pope a thief and a king of thieves and and, uh, says he should be hanged or hanged. 
They spell it with an I. So when you actually, when you actually encounter this, this glorious artistry in a Calvinist, you, you run into problems with Gilbert very, very quickly. He tries to divorce anything lovely from them. And he also does this for a, a little gent named Milton. And in encountering Milton, he goes, he goes further, and he's upset. He's, he writes in, in his essay, Milton, Man and Poet, Extended. He goes on and tries to actually rationalize away everything that Protestantism achieved, including the freedom of man. <laughs> like all the, all the things that are downstream of the Reformation, all the things that the Reformation did, and did as a consequence of giving men their Bibles back. So when the reformers gave and died to give men their Bibles in their own native tongues, when the reformers died and fought and, and went through enormous hardship to reconnect individuals into a relationship directly with the Father through the mediator of the Son, he's got to find a way to make that a problem and say, man, Calvinists, the, he says specifically, is, is quote, and I actually have a big extended quote, from this section, I'm not going to read it because I don't want to burn too much time just talking about Chesterton's failures. But he goes off on Scotch Puritans again. He talks about how the Puritans took away man's freedom in the universe, and so they must fundamentally take away his freedom in the state. He takes shot after shot at Calvinists, at Puritans, and he just, he just despises them. The first conception of Calvinism is an insistence on the utterly arbitrary nature of power. The king of the cavaliers was certainly not so purely willful, so capricious a sultan as the god of the Puritans. Like, wow. Shot after shot. And he's trying to, he's trying to find a way that, you know, freedom and America and democracy and the existence of the middle class how that conquered poverty and created like, everything. He's just trying to find a way to disassociate that from the Reformation and the Puritans and the Protestants. And the thing is, you just can't. You just can't. And even though he talks about the way that Protestantism destabilized an aristocracy, this, this dominant aristocracy that included the monks, the abbots, you know, the monasteries, and also the ruling classes, the only ones who could afford Bibles, etc., he says that it then created a worse aristocracy. The elect. <laughs> and that just bothers him. And he ignores the fact that the elect could be the beggar on the street and the king. That it was this great equalizer. That all men were equal before their Lord. Rags or riches. And he just struggles and fights. And it makes me happy to see, because I've seen so many Protestants do the same thing, to try to disassociate anything good from a Catholic source, like Chesterton. Where this part's true, but it has nothing to do with all this other stuff, he says. And then I watched Chesterton do that about us. And the thing that was so profoundly encouraging to me when I first got hooked on Chesterton and started reading him a lot more thoroughly and ran into, wait, he's actually attacking me often. So I read Orthodoxy, and then I'm reading a bunch of other things. The thing that encouraged me about it was how intimidated he was by it. How powerful the testimony, not of Milton, because Milton was a putz, and Chesterton and I agree on that. He talked about what a putz Milton was. But the testimony of his poetry, the testimony of Shakespeare's poetry, of Sidney's poetry, of Treasure Island, that adventure story. And Chesterton wrestled with that. He struggled with it. Because at the time, he could look around and say, what are the Catholics doing? What do the Catholics do? The, the great art that was pouring out of that time period was post-Reformation. All the art that trickled down to him is classic. It's like including Scottish adventure stories and then backing it up to, you know, great music and epic poetry. And he talks about how Paradise Lost, in his mind, shames Homer. That Homer is simple. That Virgil is, you know, bland. And Paradise Lost is this amazing achievement and it doesn't make any sense at all coming from these headwaters. That it's this bizarre miracle, like the bread becoming the flesh. Somehow. So I enjoyed his intimidation. I've really appreciated 
watching him struggle, reading his struggle. And we all know why he struggles. Anybody who's ever had a conversation with anyone about Calvinism knows exactly where people go in their uh, angst about it. One of the quotes you'll see from the institutes that shows up on various, you know, Armenian uh, Rotary Club websites. Armenian, I should say. Armenian, Armenian. Is this one. When Calvin says, let us see then how this difficulty should be solved. In the first place, the declaration of Solomon ought to be universally admitted that the Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. That part's usually not included when people are mad at Calvin. When Calvin says, first we should all admit what Solomon said, right? That the Lord hath made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. Right? Everybody agree? And people just like, delete I'm just posting the next part on my hate blog. Observe all things being at God's disposal and the decision of salvation or death belonging to him. He orders all things by his counsel and decree in such a manner that some men are born devoted from the womb to certain death, that his name may be glorified in their destruction. That's the quote that shows up. Ordained from the womb to certain death, that his name may be glorified in their destruction. Ooh, the Southern Baptist Convention formed a committee to talk about the rising influence of Calvin among the young and restless and how to, and how to deal with things like they did. This is real. And, and grappling with quotes like this one to show that this is bad. Is it as bad as, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So that it, then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me then, what does he, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? That's the tweet back to the SBC. <laughs> From Paul. <laughs> Send. Will what is molded say to its molder? Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience? Think of it from his perspective. Has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles." Which is the more offensive quote? <laughs> the one from Romans. And I remember a long time ago having an argument with a, a friend who was struggling with this and did not want God to have predestined the bad things to happen or the bad people. And when I tried to quote Romans, she said, man, Paul just has such a bad attitude. I can't, I don't like Paul. And I thought... We have nowhere to go from here. Like, this is, if you're willing to say those kinds of things, then, oh, well, it's, it's over then. And those are the kinds of things, incidentally, which Chesterton could ignore, Romans 9, blithely because of his faith in a Roman church. It is his Catholicism that enables him to not be a Berean, enables him to not go dive into exegesis and study the word above all else. In fact, very dis disappointingly, in an essay he wrote called Why I Am Catholic. He says one of the reasons why he's Catholic is because the Bible is not a sure foundation. Because the Bible is disagreed about. We all disagree about the Bible. So what's the point of appealing to the Bible? The Bible is useless to us without the authoritative mediation of the Roman Catholic Church. It is the Roman church which made the Bible, he says. The church has authority over the Bible. That's, they were able to decide what's in and what's out. And the church still does. The church trumps scripture. How can I like this guy? I mean, he's a Keith. <laughs> and almost as bad as that, 
He's a blasphemer upon occasion. And yet, I love this guy. He is fantastic. And there's so much we can learn from him. Just don't make him your, your concrete contractor. Don't let him pour your foundation. Let him bring in the party lights and the dancers and the music and the squirrels. <laughs> Just keep him away from the foundation. Calvin is nowhere near as inflammatory as what we find in scripture. But when you appeal to a true papist, somebody who's, and I have many friends, I've worked with people for a, over a decade who are Catholic and devout Catholic, old roommate friend who's Catholic, publishers who are Catholic, producers who are Catholic, of many, many connections to these folks, and many of them, I think, are absolutely in Christ. But they're the ones who don't pay much mind to what actually happened in the past, to what goes on to the fight. So, can God say these things? Can God do these things? What is a Chestertonian Calvinism? What does that look like? Because I think we need it, and we need it badly. We need Calvinists because we need men who are able to stand up contra mundum, very, very hard men who, when they have the truth, fear no earthly power. One of the biggest problems in the Reformation for the Catholics was that not only did it create a bunch of belligerents, it created a bunch of belligerents who actually were appealing to Scripture and God. And they were pretty unyielding, right to the stake, into the flames, to the gallows, into the waters, because they had the Word of God and God. Chesterton gets upset that he thinks Calvinism destroyed the love of an individual for God the Father, when in fact the Reformation and Calvinism connected individuals directly to God in a way that had been lost for a long time. Not to say those people did not have that connection, because they did, but it was not taught, it was not understood, it was lost. They had to count beads and sit in a box and kiss a marble toe. They had to throw coins in the coffer and get an indulgence back. An entire country could just be dismissed and declared as going to hell. Like You had all sorts of craziness going on, which Chesterton would really, really kick about if he had been back there. One of the things, and one of the, one of the things I love about Chesterton, the ironies, is the fact that he is a fruit of the Reformation. Without Tyndall, there's no Chesterton. Without Calvin, there's no Chesterton. Without the reformers winning, there's no Chesterton. Because that's what the reformers did. The reformers won, they were victorious. So, how do we incorporate the Chestertonian with Calvinism? Well, the worst kind of Calvinist, I think, is probably the kind that Chesterton knew in grade school or something. His, his real loathing for Calvinists must have come out of some strange, I think, Victorian determinists, some strange top-hatted fatalists who just would not touch the poor. They acted, you know, I think based on some of what he says, I feel like he knew men who behaved like Brahmins, like men who believed themselves to be a class above and would not touch the, the beggar on the street, would not engage. Because I have never met a Calvinist like any of the Calvinists that he describes. When he just, and he's not a liar. Like he's wrong, but he's not a liar when he talks about the behavior of Calvinists that he's seen. Is it possible for people who are reformed to get stodgy and dusty and unyielding? Yes, that is our strength. <laughs> when you need something stodgy, dusty, and unyielding, find yourself someone preferably Dutch and reformed. <laughs> Just, or a Scot, the Scots will do. Uh, that's, that's our strength. So when the tides are going one direction and, and you want people who will not yield, who will not give, who are going to be insane to the last man, to the last woman, find yourself a Calvinist. Can that personality trait ever go wrong? Oh, well, let me think about it. <laughs> yes. It can go very, very wrong, and has. It can and has gone wrong. 
And the antidote is the joy and the gratitude of Chesterton. How could it be that someone who believes that everything is from God, that everything is a gift from God, that all of it is ordained before time, and that person can walk out the door and have time to do anything other than thank God? When you go look at the sky right now, when you feel the breeze right now, if we got a little bit of rain and enough temperature to smell that rain hitting a parking lot, just, just little details like that. Did God need to make parking lots smell like that right when it rains after heat? Yes, he did. Because that's who he is. That's the kind of father that he is. Did he need to make all the amazing things that he made? I have seen some of them. And even the exotic, crazy ones on the other side of the world that we, have, that we don't get to see, like vine snakes, which have a, an amazingly fantastic architecture that's unique to them, that enables them to stick out very, very long from branch to branch, or flying snakes, which can flatten their bodies like the hood of a cobra from head to tail and slither 150 yards through the air from treetop to treetop. How can we look at that as Calvinists and do anything other than rejoice and thank God and be grateful? But as Calvinists, we tend to not. As Calvinists, we tend to want to stay in the wood shop where the boards are straight before you, know, you go out there and look at a tree where the trunk bends. We like things straight and unyielding. Chesterton is the party. Chesterton brings the party. And we need that kind of joy because we are the ones who have the justification for it. In trial, we have the justification for gratitude. How could Job like, thank God? How could Job bless God in that context? How is it even possible if it wasn't from him. Calvinism enables the gratitude which powers a man like Chesterton. It is through God's kindness that people who say that God does not, order, does not ordain everything still pray to him and still think he's going to win. Somehow. He doesn't control everything. He didn't ordain everything. But we're pretty confident he's going to win. As opposed to knowing that the entire thing is his Symphony. The entire thing is his art. There is a very real and practical way in which this functions. When you see people rejoicing in the Lord in hardship, it's because of this. This is why. It is, is it because of the doctrine of God's sovereignty, exhaustive sovereignty. The fact that he makes vessels of mercy and vessels of wrath. The fact that the devil can't touch you unless it's part of God's story. The perfect picture of that is, of course, the cross. These days, I know all sorts of young reform types around and about the kind of people who write on, you know, what feels like important websites, theologically meditative, contemplative websites. There's many, many people who want to drift back to the Catholic Church. I've seen it a lot. That drift. That drift back to EO or that drift to Roman Catholicism. It is interesting to me that that drift is, would not even be possible without the Reformation. The Catholic Church was fundamentally transformed by the Reformation. Like it just was. It could not continue to maintain all the abuses that it had been maintaining in light of this massive, glorious, bright, burning reformation and the downstream consequences of it. It actually moved into an ecosystem where it had to compete. Where they had kept everybody under lock and key and completely controlled, and then now there are free men. And so they had to try to fill their churches with free men. They have changed. Chesterton is one example of that. Is it a place you should go? I wouldn't change my last name to Keith. I, I mean, I, I can forgive Gilbert. But I'm not going to go wear that uniform. And that's just one trite little example. How can we even begin to say, yeah, let's go back over there where we say the Bishop of Rome is the head of the entire church, given how that power has been abused in the past? 
I hate to use a Nazi example, but I'm going to anyway, because there's not really a better one. What would we think of Germans who said, you know what, we should have a Fuhrer. What's wrong with a Fuhrer? Those armbands were kind of classy. I mean, it means something completely different now. We're gonna walk away from everything that was done under that flag. We're gonna pretend like it never happened. And then some Jewish kids are like, oh, can we come? It's the same thing. When you look back at the narrative and you see people say, being drawn to, but that's a really bright color of red. That's an, they wear hats. They put the things on the robes. And we have folding chairs. They don't have folding chairs. When you watch people drift back that direction, because it's ancient, the Protestant faith is just as ancient. The pro-testimony faith is just as ancient. Augustine is our father too. Paul is our father. And incidentally, the words that Paul had for the church in Rome, do not think you are the root, kind of appropriate. Send that off to the bishop in Rome. There you go. I really love Chesterton. I hope that's clear. I think we need to learn from him. He talks about joy in a way that we need to hear and we need to receive and we need to replicate. But so does Calvin. From the Institutes, chapter 10, has the Lord adorned flowers with all the beauty which spontaneously presents itself to the eye and the sweet odor which delights the sense of smell and shall it be unlawful for us to enjoy that beauty and this odor? What, has he not so distinguished colors as to make some more agreeable than others? Has he not given qualities to gold and silver, ivory and marble, thereby rendering them precious above other metals or stones? In short, has he not given many things of value with no necessary use? Have done then with that inhuman philosophy which, in allowing no use of the creatures but for necessity, not only maliciously deprives us of the lawful fruit of the divine beneficence, but cannot be realized without depriving man of all his senses and reducing him to a block. Chesterton and Calvin are brothers. And Calvin is the one who made Chesterton possible. So how should we marry these two? Well, keep your timbers straight and unyielding. But decorate the interior, celebrate, rejoice, and rejoice in all things, the hardships and the easy blessings, in chocolate ice cream and broken bones, car wrecks and sunshine. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Chesterton did, with no basis for it, philosophically or theologically, but he did. Calvinists all too often do not even though they have the premises which actually necessitate it. We are the ones who are obligated by everything we say and everything we affirm to rejoice in the Lord always, to thank him for all things, to know that we are saved by no work of our own, to receive mercy with gratitude, to strive to glorify the God who crafted us, knowing that every scene is designed for his honor. Every scene is set up for us to attempt to imitate him and become more like him. And to become more like him, that means the God who made the smell on the parking lot. That means the God who made birds' wings, skunks' tails, ferrets, a little thing called the least weasel, which doesn't live very long because it's so excited that it frequently just has a heart attack. <laughs> it just lives so hard. And so quickly that if you show it a stuffed animal, it might just be like, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> it's like a fainting goat, but it's fatal. <laughs> and God made the fainting goats too. We are the ones who said that God did all of this. We are the ones who said that God ordained all of us. And then we ignore all the conclusions that come from that. You have a father who made up fainting goats. What does that mean to you? If your last name was Disney, and this was all Disneyland, and somebody said, hey, you realize your dad made all of this, all of it's yours. And he said, really? Hmm, I've got work. 
And you made no effort at all to explore your vast inheritance. You made no effort to rejoice in every aspect of it, from venom to chocolate. All, the, all these things that we've peeled back, the, the layers of reality, and found all these mysteries and cheats. And I, I really love the way that God laid out all sorts of cheat codes in this place. So if we were a bunch of gamers at first, like level one, it's like, okay, so we're trying to survive. Luckily, there are these big wooden things that just sort of like, bloop, like here's food. They're like those easy coins at level one. Ding, 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 ding. And here's birds walking around just totally unnecessarily dropping pre-wrapped balls of protein out their backsides. <laughs> yeah, there's another one and another one. And there it goes. All right. Let's keep some of these around. And here's this big animal with a flat back that you can just sit on, make friends with. It'll carry you around. Oh, there's that cow. What's that big swinging sack underneath it? Ice cream. <laughs> the giant grass with the sugar in it that if you crush it, burn it, steam it off, get the crystals, squeeze the bag under that big animal, let it sit, skim the top, mix it together, stir. Like, this is God's world and all of it's on purpose. We need to be the people celebrating in a Chestertonian fashion, rejoicing in that way, instead of being the people saying, God ordained everything. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> like, handcrafted all of it. Lightning? Yes. <laughs> Do you find thunder impressive? Sometimes. <laughs> I had a professor who was Dutch Reformed from graduate school who once confessed to me after I wrote a paper, he called me into his office. And I, this was at a, a dry campus, incidentally, and I had told him at the beginning, I said, just so you know, I'm going to drink. <laughs> Full disclosure, I'm telling on myself now. It's going to happen. We had that kind of relationship. And he said, me too. <laughs> I was like, okay. I was like, I'm not going to get drunk. Don't worry. Never been drunk, never will. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have some good beers here. I'm not going to go a year without a good beer. I went into his office, and he read my paper, and he sat there very stiffly. And after a little while, I was wondering what he's going to say. And he said, sometimes I love sitting on the porch in thunderstorms. <laughs> I'm like, it's a step. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's a good step. We have to be the people truly celebrating. We have to own the celebration because we are the ones who can explain the celebration. We are the ones who affirm the celebration with the logic behind it. We are not the ones like Chesterton saying, God didn't do this. Thank you, God. This is glorious. And we should appreciate that thanksgiving and learn from it. And it's, just, it's, it's a tragedy to see so many of the reformed downstream through the centuries. Now, this is... this. There's a lot to it. I'm not gonna, like, I don't want to blame Calvin for this. Those guys were living in a hard time. And you still see joy. You still see celebration. You see it in the Reformers. You see it in Luther. You see it in Calvin. It's there. But it was a hard age and a hard time. We have no excuse. We have no excuse. We're 500 years downstream from this enormous blessing. We have a fantastic heritage, a legacy to carry on, to reignite. Your last name is Disney. And this little place is called Disneyland. Act like it. Act like you're the, you're the heir that you actually are. Behave like Chesterton with the clarity and the architecture and the truth of Calvin. The two men are brothers. One older than the other facilitated the other despite the resentment. Chesterton is both a brother, an older brother. He is a, he is a father in many ways to what I've tried to do. There is a, all, all the truth that I have stolen and anything I've done, anything I've written, is, it's all just ripped off. It's all just ripped off from other guys. It's ripped off from creation and then Lewis and Chesterton. It's just borrowed, sometimes cited, sometimes not. All of it is. All of it comes from them, from Chesterton, and from Calvin, the two need not be enemies. 
The vineyard is the Lord's. I don't care if Chesterton's over here saying, this is the papist side where the papist grapes grow. If they're good, they're ours. <laughs> it's just the way it goes. They're God's, so they're ours. If they're bad, burn them. We have to be celebrators. We have to be thinkers. We have to be people with vision and clarity, but we need to be faithful to that vision, and it needs to work its way out in gratitude in every aspect of our lives, from the trials, from the losses, to the birthdays and anniversaries across the board. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Thank you. I think um, one of the uh, common things that, or I think it was A.W. Tozer that said, oh, Calvin, how many sins are committed in thy name? <laughs> right, yeah. um, and he committed a few himself. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it strikes me, the, the Disney illustration, I like to use the illustration of, of, a, of a feast laid in front of us, and Calvinists oftentimes get the, um, the caricature of being the ones that are debating over whether the fork should have five prongs or four prongs um, instead of... There's a, there's a feast in front of us. It should be four. <laughs> and or I think, what about spoons? Uh, you know, Sporks, right. easily. Compromise. But the goal of a feast is not the debate over the molecular structure of the peas. It's to eat the feast. You know? So how do we, um, how do we uh, break out of the caricature of the Saturnine Calvinist and be the jovial Calvinist? Um, being the, 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 like you're saying, the, full of joy, full of wonder. The, what matters is not the reputation, because the reputation will be what it is, because the slanders have been, you know, they've lasted for centuries. But also because as soon as you are the jovial Calvinist, people will disassociate your joviality from your Calvinism. Yeah. They, they will they'll immediately say, well, that's just his personality. So nobody, when I'm starting to talk about fire ants or something, nobody says, look at that Calvinist go. They just tune that out, and they, it, they assume it's a personality quirk. And then if we talk about predestination, they'll get upset. But they're okay. And it's something with notes from the Tilt World I saw when I talked about ex nihilo creation and how it necessitates every aspect of Calvinism, just right. all of it downstream, but I didn't say that. They didn't matter. Everybody was all on board, fantastic, rah, 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 this is great, hallelujah. And it got pushed in all sorts of Arminian circles, and it was... It was Fantastic. And they're all talking about exhaustive sovereignty. Right. But if you didn't use the buzzwords, you're <laughs> fine. Um, but it didn't undo any of the reputation. So the important thing is that you be faithful yourself. That you yourself not be a caricature. Right. That you be a man or a woman of joy and gratitude. Not that, you know, stodgy, upset person who's bothered by the prongs right. at the feast. It's, right. it's not where you want to be. As a side note, something I didn't mention, but Calvinism enables us to rejoice in trial, like I said, but it also enables us to own the trials. Right. So they're from our Father, which means don't just celebrate you know, the happy, happy. Right. You look at the groaning in creation and you should own it. This is ours to remedy. Yeah. Hyenas must be stopped. <laughs> they just, they must. This, this is, you know, this is a bad thing, what they do, those hyenas. And like, we need to own it. So if it's our place, it's not just our feast, it's also our brokenness. Yeah. And so that's where dominion and, and stewardship comes in because it's ours. It's all from God, and it's all ours to steward faithfully. Yeah. Um, not that we can answer this question in uh, the, the time we have here, but uh, people can follow along with the, hey, the, the, the ferret and the, the fainting goats, and that's wonderful. And the least weasel. That's right. Um, and we, we can not along with the beautiful colors, the, the rain falling from the heavens. We, uh, Luther, Luther said something along the lines of, um, look at the God, God's raining uh, wheat upon us, and he's raining corn upon us. And he, he looks at the wonder of creation and goes, isn't this marvelous? But back to your point of the suffering um, and the hardship and the evil. Uh, the problem of evil really is where it catches a lot of people. Are you really saying God ordained that? Right. Uh, the, the cancer, the suffering, the... Yeah. Um, can you tie that back to, it really comes back, I think, to the gospel, uh, Jesus on a cross. Um, can you um, answer that um, objection? Um, yeah. So when people say that you, cannot, that you cannot go easily, just you can't go just 
tritely into suffering, like, oh, this is from God. Uh, did Job go tritely? You know, was that, but he did go there, right? And we're supposed to imitate Job, right? So if you have trial, the, ne- the next time the entire dining hall falls down and kills all your children, the next time you lose everything, what should you say? We know it's in the Bible. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. And the other option is, or circle B, curse God and die. Like those are the two. And so when Job receives it, and he knows it's not a judgment, he maintains it's not a judgment, he's the model. And then you look at Christ. He's the greater model. So he, he could say, this is not because of anything I've done, although it was because of everything he'd done. It's not because of anything he'd done wrong. But why was it coming to him? He received it. Like he received it, and he went through it, and he, and he went through it to the glory on the other side. So... If you are talking to somebody who's saying, well, how, can, how does God handle suffering? We have examples. We have the biggest example is Christ. Well, how did Christ handle it? He received it from his father. He, he begged his father. Like, he went to his father in prayer and said, take this cup from me, which you are free to do and which you should do in a trial. And then he received it. And then he drank it to the dregs. So that's what we should do. Same thing with Job. What did he do? All the way through. And then you think about everything that Job went through, and then finally, he's, mm, it's getting to him, and he gets rebuked by God himself from a whirlwind <laughs> for not passing that test. And when God talks to him, what does God brag about? What does he celebrate? It's the natural world. He even brags about listening to the, it, it brings him pleasure to hear the, the raven's young crying out to him all day. I'm betting it does not bring you pleasure. If you had a big, you know, I think it's a murder of ravens. I know it's crows. I don't know if it's a murder of ravens <laughs> as well. But if you had a nesting murder of ravens outside your house and their young were crying out to God all day long, would you rejoice in that sound? God does. And he brags about the unicorn and he brags about Leviathan. He brags about feeding the lions, carnage. It's like all of these things. Um, and we, we have to look at that. We can't just tritely, blithely go into things. And then it, it's, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing. So as far, I don't know how much time we have. How much time do we have? Right at the a end. Mi- a minute or so. A minute or so. Um, how quickly people use an emotional chip to try to change the truth. Yeah. Are you so, saying that God would? Are you, and they'll say the most ridiculous things, including wise men like Chesterton. I could never serve a God who. It's like, just bite your tongue, man. Yeah. Like, just stop. Yeah. Like, stop your mouth. Yeah. Like, and also, like, you're going to go on strike. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's, it's one of those things that if, at the end of days, if it, if it turned out that I was wrong, that we were all wrong, you know, and we thought that God was more glorious than he was, it's kind of a low stakes problem there. <laughs> <laughs> On the flip side, when you have to have that conversation of like, wait, so will you serve a God who or will you not? Because you went on the record. You went on the record saying you never serve a God who, fill in the blank. And now you're there before the throne of God where we all will stand. And you have to, you know, retract or affirm. Sheep or goat? And uh, it's just a dumb thing to say. And we, should, we should steer clear of any of that kind of language. Yeah, that's great. Uh, quickly, um, what would be the must-read Chesterton book? Orthodoxy. Uh, the thing is, Chesterton's so impatient, which is why I think his scholarship is not great, uh, but such a joy to be around. Yeah, he's, he's uh, your, he very quickly becomes your favorite uncle, you know, <laughs> to have at the party. Even when he says crazy things. Yeah, especially <laughs> when he says crazy things. Uh, he's, Those he's make in, for the best If jokes. he's in favorite <laughs> uncle category, then he's not as worrisome as if he's in father category. So favorite uncle <laughs> Keep category. him the uncle, yeah. not the father. <laughs> and he's, he's fantastic. But um, yeah. his novels are terrible. And the first part's always fantastic. And then he gets impatient. So he starts to write the novel. He's writing the story. And then he's like, yeah, anyway, here's the idea for the rest. You know, it's like, I've, I've got another one to do. I've got to go somewhere. So it's, you get these great openings. And then he's just like, yeah, there's the outline. Um, and is that because he's not a Calvinist? Well, the thing I was going to say is his, <laughs> his best novel is The Man Who Was Thursday, which is worth reading. It's fantastic. And it's his attempt to satirize Calvinism. 
<laughs> so, I mean, like, Calvinism was just the thing that he wrestled with. Um, and that thing which he wrestled with, I think, just beat him. And, and he chased it in that novel. It's a glorious novel, and it fails as a satire. And I'll, I'll end with this last thing. In his essay, Why I'm a Catholic, Chesterton goes on and says all sorts of total rotten nonsense. I mean, just absolute blather through it. And a lot of it's emotional. And it's still, like, I really I enjoy reading it. He says it very well. Um, so you're listening to this guy say all these things. And then he gets to the end and he says, sort of in like a last gasp of like, well, but if the best things of Protestant, you know, of the Puritans will all probably be, be preserved in the Catholic Church. <laughs> all, those, all those virtues of the Puritans, all the great things that the Puritans and the Protestants Bach brought to the table. And <laughs> yeah, those will be preserved by the Catholics. And, and the Catholic Church will be Puritan when the Puritans have all become pagans. And it's for that reason that I've always called him the last Puritan. <laughs> I really think he is a Puritan. He was in the Catholic Church fighting to purify it, mm. fighting to refine it. He was, not a, he was not a Protestant, but he was there. He was a Puritan. So for me, his Protestant saint name, instead of like St. Ignatius or something, is just the last Puritan, G.K. <laughs> Chesterton, which I know he would hate. <laughs> and that makes me very happy. But it'd be fun to rankle him. Uh, yeah, he's fine with it now. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much.